let me welcome everyone uh, to the February um, session of our great Wednesday webinar series. Uh, we are thrilled uh, to have Lanicia Rouse Tinsley with us this evening. I'll do an introduction in just a moment. Let me give you a couple of uh, sort of guidelines or, or as we get ready. Uh, if you have any questions for Lanicia, please send them to me in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and I will then funnel those over to Neil. And then we will take care of that toward the end of the meeting. Um, the last 20 minutes of this time together, we'll have Q&A time. Now, let me welcome again, Lanicia Rouse Tinsley. Uh, Lanicia is living in a couple of different places right now, is in between. And so uh, you'll learn more about that as we go. Um, as an artist, she's a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, her work is powerful, moving. There's an intersection of, between loss and, and love and prayer and all the things. And, and it's really rich and powerful. And I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. Uh, Lanicia, we are thrilled you are with us. And uh, I look forward to this evening, really, for my own self as an artist and person that does that. I'm thrilled. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it now over to Neil Willard, the rector of Palmer Memorial Episcopal Church. Thank you both. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. Uh, Lanisi, it's such an honor to have you with us, uh, and I'm so glad that um, uh, that you're in town sometimes, but you're out of town other times. So actually, where are you now? Tonight, I am in Richmond. Tomorrow, I'll be in Houston. <laughs> Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> that is. Not Richmond, Texas. Richmond, right. Virginia. Yes. How do, you, how, do you spend your, how do you spend time in the two places? Is that yes. different? Yes. Fortunately, um, a little last year, I got a studio okay. here in, um, I guess it's been over a little, a year here in Richmond. And so I'm able to really split time. I am in partnership with Holy Family, um, HTX Episcopal Church. And so I go back once a month um, for that partnership and then some other work that I'm doing. And I still have a studio there. So I just jump right in off the plane into the studio. <laughs> Well, you know, like thinking of your work as an artist, um, when when people introduce you as an interdisciplinary artist, what for people who aren't used to that world, what does that mean? Yeah, so multidisciplinary, and it really means that I um, explore and express my creativity through various mediums and disciplines, writing, speaking, teaching, um, photography, painting. And so I have a multidisciplinary approach to my studio practice, yeah. Um, but and I'm always curious about people who kind of live in the creative sphere. Like, um, you know, I know people who who they they go through life and then they see someone else doing so, like they play the guitar and they're like, oh, you know, I want to learn how to do that. And so they take lessons and maybe they're not very good at it at the beginning. They learn how to do it well as well as they want to to do it. And then there are other kinds of people who um, they're just like they're yeah, like even my oldest son is sort of pre-programmed to love math in a way that I can't even begin to imagine. But it's like he it's like he was born that way. Mm. So when you think of your your own kind of calling as an artist, I mean, is that something that you were curious about, learned, you know, developed and continue to nurture? Or do you think of it more as something that was even if you weren't aware of it all the time that that you discovered and it was already there? Does, I mean, does that make sense? Is it something that was sort of within you that you you are, are a gift from God to be able to see that? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think, um, yes, in a way, you know, my friend Jacob, he often says that um, creating is one of the most human things that we can do. And I truly believe like creativity is in our DNA um, as humans. Everybody's doing DNA. Oh my gosh, every day we are making, creating a life and um, activating that part of ourselves in various ways throughout the day. Uh, I am fortunate enough that my work um, almost compels and demands that I spend a lot of time nurturing that part of myself through artistic practice. And so... Yeah, I think they're, you know, my little niece, God niece reminds me, she's a little artist and um, that, that some of us are just born. She just has really, she's five years old and just is like, just has a natural gift for it. 
um, and that there are those of us who have gifts and capacities for different things. Um, but then over time, we have to cultivate that. We right. have to develop it. Um, we have to do the work. And so um, my mom, when I was younger, would always say, because I was a singer, and she was like, you've got to practice. You've got to use your voice or you'll lose it. And lo and behold, like sometimes when I sing now, it's hard to believe that I used to lead worship sometimes in my old days. But yeah, the voice, that instrument gets rusty. And so I think um, we can have gifts, but if we don't spend the time really cultivating it and nurturing it um, and developing it, um, yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't flourish. It doesn't thrive in that sense. So some natural, but we all have a creative spirit and essence within us. And then that energy is all around us and we can tap into that. Yeah. Do you think uh, you mentioned uh, like a child's perspective just a minute ago. And I always think one of my favorite phrases from the baptismal liturgies in the Episcopal church is after someone has been baptized, whether the, whatever their age, there's a prayer that sort of ends with that they would be given the gift of to be able to see uh, the gift of joy and wonder and all of, all of God's works. And I often think about that with children's perspectives on the world. And then as we grow up and we learn how to be adults, it's almost like that gets squeezed out of us. And I, and I feel like one of the purposes of church, let's say, for example, is to uh, reignite that gift of joy and wonder in our in ourselves throughout our lives. And I kind of wonder, though, do you think that there's that art does that too, way, hmm. reawakening something in people that, um, you know, like you said, they all have this gift, but, you know, when we're out doing, you know, our uh, grown-up careers and things like that, sometimes we just sort of stop looking around for those things, maybe around us or within us. Yes, I do think that um, being an artist and that practice has helped me um, grow in my ability to pay attention um, and to and to look and to see. Um, I, I think I've always though my my family would say in my husband that I just have this like natural um, inclination to just towards wonder and amazement um, as I move around the world, just kind of always looking with these like dazzling eyes, almost expecting to encounter um, something <laughs> magical or beautiful. Um, are wonderful in this world um, and sometimes in the most unexpected places. But I have seen in doing workshops and journeying with people who would not necessarily say they're um, artists as a profession, right? Um, and maybe not even hobby in it, hobbyists, but when they have time to really spend time at the the will or to at the art table, like the will, the clay will, um, potter's will, or at the art table making or sewing or doing something creative, that it does um, almost kind of activate um, or help them to see things or even experiencing art and being encountered by art and spending time with art can help us see the world ourselves and things in a little different way. And I, I've seen that awakening within people um, when they allow themselves to kind of stop and and name that, right? right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And reflect on, on, on what has happened um, in that creative act, yeah. I'm, I'm laughing a little bit about creativity. I don't know if anyone can faint here a little bit in the background, some uh, some music. There's actually Mexican folk dancing practices taking place in the basement, and it kind of rises up like incense through my office. And so just Love in it. case, that's what that is. Um, yeah. uh, you mentioned your uh, art studio th that you have now. Uh, but, and I don't know if it was the, f then earlier than that, the first art studio that you had, I don't really know, but, um, when you walked into this downtown lo location that, that became a place of creation for you, um, you know, I know from conversations you've had in other places that you, you walked into that creative space, but you were walking out of the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a about that, the loss that birthed this new thing, and then what, if anything you think is the relationship between that loss and this creativity? Mm, well, you know, I have been on quite a journey <laughs> um, in my life. And, you know, I was in ministry in the local church for a number of years. Um, and I was constantly burning out for various reasons. Um, and in 2011, during one of my burnout, um, really 
depressive states. Um, I met pastors in Houston who invited me to come and manage an art project wow. with men and women living on the streets. And I and what I like to start here because it was coming to the art project and being able to create in that shelter, being able to sit and participate in art workshops with the artists in the program, um, as well as just spending time in the art studio with artists in the program, that I began to um, kind of tap into my own well of creativity and reawaken that artist that was within me. Um, and I'd always, you know, since a child, wanted to be an artist, but was afraid. And um, really walked a very logical, in my mind, kind of way, route. More proper. Right? <laughs> More yeah. proper. In a place where I felt affirmed, you know, in ministry and church and sure. in leadership, I had gifts in those areas and were affirmed um, in them. And it seemed less risky for me. Um, but anyway, so I was part of the art project and in doing that work in Houston, um, I met um, the most amazing man, um, Cleve Tinsley. And we fell in love and as love does, we created a life. And that life came into the world um, at a time when I was really at a place of just unsettledness anyway, and wanting to um, beginning to really reimagine. And I think having a partner in life um, helped me get some courage and just beginning to kind of name that out loud. And then I was like, I wanna be a mom that is not afraid. <laughs> I want to be a mom that is fully living into who um, she believes she is to be in this world. And um, and so I started doing the work because of her life within me. I started doing that work with a therapist. I started dreaming and dreaming out loud um, dreams that I had had silently in my heart. And then five and a half, less than five months into my pregnancy, I started experiencing complications. Um, and at that time they called it, and I like to name it because I don't think we talk a lot um, about, we all celebrate when people are pregnant and when the babies come, but we we grieve the loss and silence often. And um, there's something that a lot of women have experienced called an incompetent cervix. And basically your cervix, and it's an awful name, a really bad name. Sure, yeah. But basically your cervix is not strong enough to carry this, um, pregnancy full term without support. And we just did not know that I needed that support. And so we named her Anne Jordlene AJ. And she came into the world on December 4th, um, lived 2013 and lived um, a little over two hours and Cleve got to hold her. She was no longer a figment of his imagination. Um, mm -hmm. I got to hold her wiggling, but her just her lungs weren't fully developed, and um, she just cannot sustain the life. And we were advised, yeah. So anyway, um, we allowed her to live and feel, experience that love um, with us as long as her little lungs would allow her to do so. And um, yeah, and then so she was born, and on the same day she died, and. Um, that loss broke me in ways I'd never been broken before. And my dad was a pa is a pastor. Um, so I've experienced both the joys and the deep griefs and sorrows of life. And death is something that is familiar to me and the unexpected um, sorrows of life that hit us. But this hit differently. Oh, yeah. Like, when it's oh, my gosh. It just hit so differently, Neil. And... Um, through my grieving process, the initial grieving process, um, art was this place um, playing with watercolors, no words, just color and water um, was cathartic for me. Um, I would, I couldn't sleep some nights and I would just be on the floor playing with watercolors. <laughs> um, and paint and pushing it and drawing a little and then just playing with the colors and my tears mingled in um, to the water on the page. And as I began to see a bit clearer, you know, the grief, the initial grief is just so foggy and heavy. Um, I began to name like, okay, if I am going to live with the pain of her absence for the rest of my life, um, it never goes away. 
um, then I need to figure out how, because I'm still here and mm-hmm. I've got to figure out how I'm going to live because I'm still here. And I started making choices of ways that I could live and honor the mother that I was beginning to be for her, um, to honor the life that she had sparked within me, honor her life and presence. Um, I just was like, I want to be an artist. That's what I, that's what I want to do. I want to make things with my hands. I want to get a studio downtown. I want to share art. I want to sell art. Um, I want to make space for art to happen for other people. Um, it sounds like it made you more bold than you oh, would have beforehand. Is that an accurate for way? Sure. I really think so. You know, and there was a part of me when you lose the most just like I just couldn't imagine, right? That kind of right. moment. Um, right. And it's like the one thing you fear, the, the people that are close and loving your heart when they, it was mm-hmm. kind of like, oh my, losing any of the other things that I did, like all oh, my excuses for why I couldn't leap, right. <laughs> why I couldn't risk on myself, why I couldn't believe in the possibility of my dreams. Um, mm-hmm. All of that stuff seems so small in comparison. It's like, oh, if I can make it through this, um, I can make it through anything. And um, the fear of not doing it honestly became greater than the fear of doing it. And That's really it. interesting. Wow. What a, what a change that is. Yeah. 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 And so um, I wanted to honor her life. I wanted to um, figure out a way of living and surviving um, and thriving and art living into this identity finally um, as an artist was what I needed to do. And so I did the work and with this help of family and friends and community and um, believing. Um, I want to read someone mentioned that, you know, when, when a parent dies or someone older dies, you know, some of their memories die with them that they didn't share with you. And that's, mm-hmm. that's sad, but, but, but when things happen out of the order, they're supposed to happen. When you bury a child, you're also burying your future with them that was supposed to be. And that's a different different kind of loss. And you can't get that back. But in this case, some of what you were describing opened up a different kind of future for you that you might not have had. Um, I mean, you might be doing different things right now or something. I don't know. It's just, for just sure, a, yeah. I mean, and I would say her, her life is yeah. begin to break that open within me and then the death and the loss of her the loss of that um dream and possibility of life with her um propelled me just pushed me further um yeah but it was her her, her existence that began to break that for me yeah i, I was struck when you took the watercolors and your tears and just sort of um doing that it made me think about uh prayer and how that's connected to you know uh, painting or something else because i think you know we've all met some people some people struggle with prayer as a kind of spiritual discipline because they think it's supposed to fit in this tiny little box somehow like this is only done a certain way uh but there are lots of different ways that people think about prayer even without words while they're doing something or while they're doing nothing but trying to listen to god and i'm wondering um you know whether it's back then or whether it's now, do you think of yourself as praying whenever you're painting? Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, on the good days, <laughs> I think sure. so. Yeah. It is like when I'm able to really lock in and, um, you know, I think it was mother Teresa who says, you know, somebody asked her like, what happens when you pray? And she was like, uh, what do you say? It's like, no, I just listen. What does God say? God listens, you know, that kind of thing. And seriously, in the midst of painting, it is that kind of um, just mystical sacred space for me when I can really lock in Um and sometimes, you know, it's in the midst of kind of praying with my hands. Sometimes I will say, um, and I really feel that um, in the studio. Sometimes it's after a session in the studio and then I'm sitting and it's like, oh, this thing I've been carrying within me after this, there's some clarity around it or um, a takeaway from the process that's like, oh, wow. Or some of my meditation and before I even began, um sitting with poets or 
Um, it's just sitting with my journal in silence is in some ways a prayer way of attending um, right. to yeah, a presence right. that's greater than myself, attending to my needs, my thoughts, um, my desires, um, my questions, my doubts, and to other people in the world around me. And so, yeah, I do. I feel like my studio is almost like the prayer closet or the sanctuary. Sure. Yeah. yeah. For me. Interesting. I, um, so I, the congregation that, that, that I'm a part of, I, one of the words that comes up in a lot of different people's experience they, and for different reasons uh, is the word beauty. Now for some people, and some people that's the people uh, that make up the community. For some people, it's the architecture of the building or the beautiful barrel vaulted ceiling or other people, it's the sound of the choir or the way we do the liturgy or something like that. And, and, and one or more of these ways, you know, it brings them into the presence of God, the, the beauty of God's presence uh, in the world that God has made, kind of reorients them to the world. And you once said in an interview that your imagination is often sparked by beautiful things. And I'm wondering um, if you could say something about that. Yeah, you know, and I see beauty. Um, I have a very expansive uh, mm -hmm. view of what beauty right. is. What is that? It's yeah. so subjective, right? Um, but when I, I feel like I know the, the beautiful when I encounter it, um, moving around the things that make me pause and just stand still, like bring me to stillness in the world. And that could be walking down um, town and there's a wall with these textures that just resonate in a way that it's just like, oh, wow, it's the age, the story, the colors um, just draw me or it's um, listening to a song or playtime with my god niece you know or just sitting on a couch with my husband i encounter beauty and so um when i encounter in these moments um they're always just kind of in my mind like you take them in they're there and they show up in ways that inspire and informed what i create in my studio and um and it could be like an event that happened or an encounter from two years ago and then I'm in the studio and something happens and I'm like whoa it's just this connection a point of remembering right I'm like oh yeah that's what's this that's what this is this that sparked this you know um and just kind of defies time in some ways but yeah it does spark my imagination and shows me sometimes what's possible mm -hmm. um, for us and these glimpses of beauty and it's like I want to work with um in my studio, if it's creating or um, with other people and creating a world, right? I want to, um, if we can glimpse it, that means we can, it's possible. Um, and so I allow that to spark my imagination for community building and world. Um, yeah. Do world. you find like when you're looking for beauty in the world, or maybe you're encountering beauty in the world, like I often think about people are sometimes expecting to find God and fireworks in the sky when, you know, not looking down at the shadows around their feet and like God's nearby and in, in ways that they're not expecting that, you know, God to be present. And mm -hmm. um, have you been surprised by beauty, I suppose, in unexpected places? Yeah. You know, I think there are moments when I um, kind of am moving and I am surprised by um because I may be like out of tune and just like, ex just expecting and knowing that like it's all around us and I have to be paying attention. And so it'll just kind of shock me in a way. <laughs> um, there are sometimes I, I, I've lived though. And I think I'll, I'll say this when I think about your question from our early childhood, my, my parents kind of shaped my sister and I to believe that beauty, um, that goodness, that love, has no bounds it's mm -hmm. like everywhere yeah. right and sure. so the world society may tell us that these places are absent of yeah. of beauty of love um of goodness but that's not always true um or not true and so i think i haven't been surprised in that way you know like um yeah um so i'm always just kind of looking but i've been surprised just because i've be able to like pay my eyes have gotten lazy <laughs> I, love that. I mean that notion about what are the boundaries um 
uh, I, you know, in, in the Episcopal Church worship services, we say the Nicene Creed on most Sundays of the year, mm -hmm. and in the Creed we speak of Jesus as, and I, this is, these are the words I love the most. I mean, the, I just find them so beautiful, like God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and then later we say, you know, whose whose kingdom will have no end. And that last part describes an ongoing reign of love through and beyond time. But I also like to think of it as having no end spatially, you know, reaching in every direction as far as the east is from the west, so that so that God's love actually goes beyond what you imagine, what you think its limits must be. Like even if you feel God forsaken or abandoned, as Jesus did on the cross, that you know, and then you know, you're reminded Jesus wasn't beyond the reach of love, and neither are we. Um, and I just, you know, again, that's that's such a remarkable thing to think about that no one is beyond the reach of of divine love. Um, have you experienced that in your own life or 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 witnessed that in a powerful way in the lives of others where, you know, again, the, the, the reach of love is just far beyond what people like they just can't imagine it. Mm. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, in my own life, I would say uh, there are ways in which um, when I have been in like just like my deepest moments of grief, sorrow, um, and depression, where love has reached down um, to hold me through friend, people. Um, and sometimes it's been in the most unexpected <laughs> um, ways and moments um, for sure. And then, you know, as a pastor and as a preacher's child, I'm, I, I've, gosh, seen look, yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot and I've seen a lot of testimonies um, and firsthand and heard testimonies of people who, um, yeah, that love just never let them go um was always there and would show up in small ways and in big ways if we remain open to it and so in my life um it's just been this constant practice i think one of my sp spiritual practices in a way is to cultivate a, a a way of moving in the world where i remain open um mm -hmm. to possibility of love showing up um and just kind of yeah, just remain open to it and um, and do the work of just kind of like understand, growing in my understanding, evolving in my understanding of what love is, you know, and I think that'll be a lifelong work. Yeah, or <laughs> um, it might appear, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and how it might appear. And um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm grateful that love runs deep and wide and um, is infinite. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the things I'm really curious to know your thoughts about, I, I'm not an artist. I, I like to wordsmith things and tinker with words. And so I certainly know what it's like to look at a blank screen on this computer and <laughs> think, I don't even know how this is going to start. Oh, that's uh, so intimidating. <laughs> and I wonder if uh, there's probably a lot of people kind of outside of artistic realms who just, they, they think they know how you like, surely you're just, you're in your beautiful studio and you have a blank canvas there and you just immediately start, you know, creating things. Uh, I'm wondering like, what is the longest you have stared at a blank canvas wow. before something took root and started to grow into, and into something beautiful? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Or what are uh, some of those experiences like? Maybe if you don't, you don't even have to tell us about the longest time you stayed. At right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, there's a painting I've been staring at for five years and <laughs> every now and then I'll go and add a couple of marks and then abandon it for another four months. Um, and um, I probably should uh, say it's done, but no, I keep working on it. I keep staring. Yeah. It haunts me in my studio. Um, but I think, you know, when I first started off, I, there was this moment where I was uh, commissioned, not a moment, I was commissioned in 2016 by um, Holy Family mm -hmm. to create a series of pyramid abstract paintings that were six feet by six feet. It was the largest I'd ever painted before. I remember, but, I'd forgotten about this, but I remember this when you said the scale of that for some reason. Yeah, six feet by six feet, nine of them. And, um, you know, the canvases came, they ordered them, they showed up in my studio and they sat there for about a month. 
<laughs> before I touched them. And I happened to be in the art um, store one night and um, the manager, he asked me, he was just like, how are those big paintings going? Because he knew all about it. And it was like, they're the masterpieces of minimalism, you know? And uh, we just had a laugh. And he's like, you know, paint big, just go big, you know, get you a big brush, just, you know, paint some colors. And we talked about like color techniques or whatever. And he's like, and just remember the canvas is strong enough to hold all of your energy and all of your truth. And there was something about that, that was, that just broke me open and helped me muster up the courage to go back to my studio that night and just paint big. And it was for um, Lent mm -hmm. and it was, I knew that painting for Lent, the first painting I was working on was really going to take me places internally. Um, the places touched the grief, touched the tenderness in ways. And I think I was avoiding that. But once I realized, oh, the canvas can hold that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to shy away from that in the work. I can go there and then allow it to take me to where I need to go. Um, I just went big. And it was so funny to walk in the studio the next morning and I looked at that canvas. I was like, whoa, wow. All right, let's go. <laughs> have you ever looked at something like that? And I, I'm curious, like every once in a while, I find something I wrote a long time ago. And I almost, it's almost like I'm looking at someone else's, like almost like someone else created that. I'm like, I don't really remember all that was going on. To, do you ever, does that ever happen to you when you're looking at yes. Like, like who made that? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's happened. That was a strange thing to ask, but I'm just curious. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's happened a couple of times. Honest, if I'm honest, you know, right. and I think those are the moments um, when we are like total, they call it um, the zone, you know, yeah. like we're like we get in this runners get into, you know, yeah. athletes can get into it and where you just time just has no, like you just lose all sense of time. Right. Right. And then you come out of it and it's like, whoa, you know, without any kind of enhancement, it's just seriously, right. yeah. you are in the work, right? And in the flow, that's what they call it, the flow. And I've had those moments and you step back and like, whoa. And then I've also had the moments because you create these paintings in a particular moment in time. And then you continue to live, the paintings live and you look back and you're just like, oh, that person, I'm not that person anymore. Oh, I created. No, that's a different kind. Yeah, that's, that's a, different a different kind of thing, right? Yeah, a very different kind of thing. That's really and interesting. We too, experience yeah. them both. Yeah. Now, the one that you have that you've been looking at. So, when you're in a process like that, and do you um, do other people get to see that while you're working on it, or is that just sort of like that's just for you for now until it's mm -hmm. done? How does that work? Or is it different for different pieces? You know what I mean? Like, is that just sort of like a private thing till it's finished, you know? Right. Yes. You know, um, earlier in my practice, I shared a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding the more as I've grown as an artist and um, developed my practice, the more those moments I like to keep just between me and the canvas yeah. in the studio um and sharing glimpses sometimes of the process but I don't share as much as I used Interesting. to I wondered about that uh, yeah and sometimes it's just the practicalities of it it's hard sure. to like set up the camera you know and, and it feels like a performance and when you really just like the work is demanding that you just be in the work right and not be distracted by trying to capture um, when you can't afford to pay somebody just to be in the studio all the time filming and photographing you. So, yeah. Um, one of the images from the Bible that I think about a lot is Jacob wrestling with an angel or with God at the river Jabbok in the, in the old Testament. And, you know, it's hard and he's injured and yet he refuses to leave that moment without a blessing. Then he gets a new name that's related to the striving that took place. And I'm wondering like, um, whether it's when you're in the flow or going with the, you know, in the flow or, or just um, your creative spirits kind of um, working things out in your studio. Does, does that ever look like that? Like you're wrestling with something or striving with something or someone? All the time. Interesting. Okay. Most of the time it's myself. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Any, yeah. It could be all yeah. kinds of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but yes, that wrestle is real. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I had, uh, oh, I, I, this is, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, and I can't even, I'm not even sure I'm looking across your shoulder at some of the things that I can't see it in detail, but when I was looking on your website, um, not all of your art, but there was a lot of art that I saw the ones, the, the pieces that had people in them, mm. individuals or a couple of people. I, I don't know why, but for some reason I was struck by the number of them that had individuals maybe moving towards something or, but they're, but they're moving away from the viewer mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they're leading the viewer towards something as well. I mean, did I imagine that or, or can you say something about that or. Oh, I love coincidence that. or what, what. Uh... Uh, no. And um, whatever you see is what you see. And yeah. so I thank you. I, I love to hear what people see mm -hmm. and the questions that are stirred when they are encountered by my work. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, and yes, I do incorporate the likeness of humans who are often not forward facing um, with a gaze that is um, confronting or looking at the viewer or creating that kind of eye intimacy. But more so, um, I'm really, I've always just found really beautiful as a photographer, capturing those moments when people are fully um, in life and not aware. <laughs> um, yeah. I just always found that beautiful. And even if um, and sometimes the moments are just so sacred and, you, you know, there's th things that I don't want to capture it with my, um, not capture, but, you know, create a photo of the moment. I'll just stare and just find it so beautiful <laughs> when people are just full, freely dancing and right. moving and being and cooking and laughing and playing. And so in my work, yes, I one aspect is um, the figures are inviting the viewer into this life that is upon that they are living on the surface and the story um, that is um, I'm creating. Um, yeah, that, the notion that um, they might be leading you into whatever it is. Uh, it could be almost anything you imagine that, it, right. you're, that they're doing. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, you know, Orthodox icons, that there are these windows into something. And in fact, when you were talking about different perspectives, you know, I, I was thinking about how I feel when I look at different perspectives. There's a there's a modern painting, really, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but it's kind of like an icon, but he's wearing like a rumpled suit, you know, from the, uh, you know, the 1930s, 40s. Um, but what, but the thing that gets me is that he he's definitely not looking away. In fact, he's looking directly into my eyes in a way that I find very, very unsettling, which is actually in, in this particular case, why I like that one painting. Like I've kind of felt like I need to get a copy of it and put it on the wall so that he could keep an eye on me. Um, but that's not always, you know, it's just a particular thing uh, versus like you said, where someone's just living life and, and you're joining them and the joy of, you know, of living. That's a different, that's a very different feeling than. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, um, I think it mirrors my, my own personal um, experience of life and also the lives of people who um, compel me to keep living and leaning in and who inspire me in various ways. And so it all, all of those things works its way into, onto the surface. And so, but thanks for noticing that. Um, it is I, aesthetically I, too, yeah. And sometimes it's the care of these images because I'm using found images of sometimes with people that I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And I've recently started using um, my own, some of my own imagery um, photos that I've taken with people that I'm able to ask for their permission sure. to use. And so part of it was an aesthetic kind of um, conscious choice, but also I love the invitation um, into, a, into a world, into a story, into a life. Um, I call my work visual poems. Well, and, um, yeah. And so that's what I'm doing. Think about being curious about other people's lives. One, one of the things that I love about the the you know the neighborhood setting uh, or the setting of the church that I serve is that, you know, in one direction, there's kind of... Um, like intellectual curiosity at Rice University in the direction of the you know largest medical center in the world. There's a scientific curiosity about the world. Um, and then on the other direction, there's Herman Park. And so there's a, you know, there's a curiosity about 
you know, the world, you know, you're playing in the world that God made. Um, and then in the other direction, a little further away is the museum district. And so I think of it as, you know, the curiosity of the creative human spirit. And, and for me, that just really, I, all of those things tied together really, really fascinate me. And I'm curious about like, I mean, what are, where, where are places you go to be, um, inspired by curiosity about the world or uh, human life or the lives people live, the challenges they face? Um, are there places that, that spark that for you? Oh, wow. Yes. I, I love public um, art spaces. Hmm. Yeah. So even in um, Houston, I love like the Manil and all of the spaces around that. Um, I just enjoy traveling. I love to travel and I like to go to cities and just walk. Mm. Um, I find that often kind of tends to that need within me of encountering beauty and sparking my imagination and um, yeah, in ways that kind of fuels my creativity. Um, I love city streets and like walls, storied walls. Like sure. Something. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, don't be in a car with me and yeah. uh, <laughs> driving downtown <laughs> Houston or like anywhere, really, if we're going on a trip and because I will stop and we may not get there on time because I will stop and I will be with whatever has captured my eyes, <laughs> you know, right. in that moment and photograph it and just delight in it. Um, you know, I, and you, so you do that, like, that's who you are and that kind of thing. I, I thought about that um, a lot. I mentioned it in a sermon once during more of the height of the pandemic. And, and I, and we were taking walks in the neighborhood. Right. And I realized that there's certain streets that I walked down beforehand, but there's other streets that I never walked down. In fact, I never drove down them because they weren't the shortest distance between point A and point B. And it really caught me off guard what I noticed by having to experience the world around me differently. Oh, yeah. And it was like, it was almost embarrassing. Like, I, I don't even think I've been down this street. <laughs> I certainly don't really remember seeing these houses or something like that. And you, you notice little things or details or the people living there. Um, I don't know. That was a, it was a, it was a good thing to have reawakened. It makes me wonder what am I missing in daily life? That <laughs> right? Yes. You know, a fun thing for me was, um, we live in third ward, but I would take an Uber or Lyft sometimes downtown Houston, have them drop me off and just walk around downtown. And it was such a, like, you know, if I hadn't been able to travel a lot and during the pandemic, I would just go downtown. Right. And just yes. walk <laughs> and, you know, and see or go to the park. Like that kind of, that walking and seeing life differently because our cars, we just miss, like you said, we just things in the car. Yeah. And sometimes it's automatic, you know, we're right. just going and not really fully paying attention. Um, but yeah. So um what thinking of living in Houston, what what's something that you really love about the city of Houston? Oh, the people, hands down. I think some of the best people um, in the world are in Houston, Texas. Honestly, I tell people that all the time. I love the people of Houston. Um, and then I do, I really, the food culture. Yes. <laughs> we have some of the best food. Yeah. Um, that. And then, um, you know, I do enjoy like the Manil, um, the Saitambli Gallery, it's one of my favorite in the Roscoe Chapel. Um, really love that. I like our public um, artworks. I do. And I think part of that has to do with the work I did with the art project. And when I did that work, I always knew like that was like the living room walls of the people who were in my community that I loved. And, and so I started paying attention to like the spaces that were being cultivated in our city um, for everyone um, of beauty. And we have some really cool spaces in our city that everybody can access you know and art that everyone can see and um I love there that. There was some new art that I I like I, I started seeing on Twitter and people were, a few people were posting on Facebook and I don't know much about it. I don't know if you do either but it was like um public murals and it had to do with kind of the justice system or they were I don't remember mm. jail do you know any do you know much about that or I um, yeah, I don't know the details, but I've seen the work downtown. Okay. They're phenomenal. Have you seen them? 
I've only seen photographs. I haven't seen them, you know, I, had, I didn't get out of my car. I didn't drive down there and get out of my car to look at them yet. But uh, no, I'm fortunate enough that I, on the freeway, I pass a couple of them on my way to the studio from my house. And so I just see them and, um, oh, that's the other thing I love about Houston. We have the best sunrises and sunsets. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Next to Paris. I do love those. Okay. But Houston has some beautiful sunrises and some beautiful sunsets. And um, I love just the open sky, the openness of the sky. It's just uh, breathtaking. I'm, th I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, uh, so Roger has a question about your work with pro the Project Row Houses in the Third Ward. What's that? Yes. Yes, in 2020, I got um, invited to do an installation, selected to do an installation in the house, and it was opening the weekend that the city shut down, mm -hmm. um, and so it was never fully open to the public, um, but I stayed in that house for two weeks creating um, a collaged abstract experience through the walls of that shotgun house. And um, it was I just one of the most impactful um, creative processes, art experiences I've ever had. I mean, definitely a pivotal moment in my career so far. And then last um, fall, I was in, got to do an installation in the gallery of artwork. It was revisiting that round um, so that people, the public could encounter some of our work. And I did some collage pieces for that, um, yeah. But it was post Project Row and the time I spent in that house that I began to move from solely doing abstract paintings to then exploring um, mixed media collage work and where it just really awakened this love and joy of um, collage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, when you were talking about public art, uh, we talked a little bit um, before we started the webinar. I lived in Richmond for a year uh, that would have been sort of the school year, 95, 96. Um, so uh, b before you moved there. And, and so in between the time that I lived there and the time that you moved there, um, you know, if you had told me in the mid 1990s that the landscape of Richmond would be altered, uh, I think of public art along Monument Avenue, I could not have conceived of circumstances which would have, you know, um, led to that. Um, and yet you moved there. And when did, when did you move to Richmond? What was going yeah, on? We, we moved Africa? here August, 2020. And one thing I, when, as soon as I came, I was like, oh, something happened here. Right. The people spoke here right. in very real, tangible, visible, visible ways. And, um, I had never seen Monument Avenue before, um, but I definitely saw after the the revolution, the the way in which people just spoke through paint and graffiti and color and yeah. So there was public art that was put up in a certain time period, and 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 by the way, I've I've seen historians bring up kind of the real estate ads at the time, and and they were restricted deeds, and and the feature of the ad was that it was going to be a white neighborhood. And that's why you would want to move there. Right. Um, and houses around that. And so, but, and and I think when you were there, all the, like, like you said, the Robert E. Lee statue was still there and it had been made into a new kind of public art. I mean, it was still public art, but it was a new public art. It what, was what, public so what, art. What, 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 what did you see? Yes, what I saw was um, the people kind of, um, in some ways, just recreating. <laughs> that space and naming truth telling um it became a memorial um for the lives of people who had been killed by police officers over the years um it was a place of community gathering um there was actually a basketball court that was built so i imagine that people protested and stayed on that land for a while. Um, we came in the aftermath and they'd planted a garden beside the monument. Like it really became this place of, of life. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, things that were like really leading people, even in the very, um, very direct words of like these, this change needs to happen, mm -hmm. but it was a change that was pointing towards life for us all. And so those words, the gardens, the colors, the, 
kids, the people playing ball together, people were eating, it became just this new thing. Um, and I just, I didn't know the old thing, but because I grew up in South right. Carolina, <laughs> I grew up in the South, went to school in North Carolina, I kind of know what the old sure. thing is. And um, what I saw, I remember the first time I went, I, I cried, like I wept. Um, it was beautiful to me. Um, the people saying like enough, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it was a place of real grief too, of, of like memorializing and remember, like just seeing all of the people who had died, right? In this way. And um, so it was, yeah, it was a very, that first encounter was a really- um, Were you doing art at that time? And when, when you moved there, were you doing a lot of art or where, um, where was that in the timeline of things? Sure, yeah, I was still an art maker. Yeah, I've been doing art since 2014. Um, and I, when we moved here, I didn't have a studio, but in our loft apartment, um, I created a little nook space that I took over and I was doing collaging. And so, you know, um, that's the great thing about collage. It's very mobile <laughs> and I can do it small or large. And so, um, it allowed me to keep creating and responding to life, um, through my art. Yeah. Um, here at Palmer, we have an art gallery in our parish hall, and it's fun to see that change, you know, through the year. Um, but at uh, Holy Family Episcopal Church, where you're the artist in residence, there's an art gallery with your name on it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that or, or how that came to be or, or when that came to be? Yes, Holy Family um, is a church plant, and they um, got a building, um, and it opened April April of last year, and part of the building design, it was a art gallery. And because of our partnership and relationship, my relationship with the church, they asked if they could name it um, after me in honor of that partnership and the work. And so it is the Lenicia Rouse Tinsley Gallery, and we um, host exhibitions wow. um, and have a curation team that is caring um, for stories and artists and their works and inviting people into the space um, to be encountered by that work. And um, yeah, and we have is that an the first idea. time your name had appeared in a place like that in, in that way or? What is it? Is that the first time your name appeared in a place like that in that way? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. I remember when I was asked, um, I was so moved because you yeah. know, I grew up in churches and I knew that names came because people gave a lot of money. <laughs> you know, that's when churches would name spaces. And I um, I was like, wow, whole, this community is doing something different um, than I'm a part of. And I was really honored and really moved by this new um, way of imagining um, space and honoring. And so it's, um, yeah. It's been yeah, you know, whether you're thinking about that, I mean, that kind of brings it into sharp focus, but even the works that you create, uh, I know you do it because you love doing it or you feel compelled to do it or it's just what you need to do. Um, but do you ever think about things you create, you know, literally leaving living beyond you and having kind of a an ongoing presence in the, you know. <laughs> in the world that God has made. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite a thing to ponder that you leave behind something and it's, that's already, you know, you know, that's, that's a part of what you're creating. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I do. I think, um, I don't think too much about legacy I, yeah. and those things, but, um, it is, is a person who will not necessarily have a child. Mm -hmm. um, that um, will continue to tell my story and be a keeper of the story. It is, I do feel very privileged that I'm able to, um, yeah, that I have opportunities to to leave and tell a story that may live beyond me. And um, yeah, that's, yeah, it's honored. I'm honored. Even, uh, you know, as you said, you see what you see in a painting. I sometimes wonder about that too like uh whatever story you saw there uh, some of the stories that you leave behind will be stories you didn't even envision like the, the stories that uh are given birth you know from people experiencing them and, and reflecting on them or that's sort of, yeah. that's sort of an unusual thing as well yeah think. and i think it puts a response for me also it 
kind of creates another level of like responsibility of the work that I do create, you know, that I want to create work that um, can participate in conversations for a time yeah. um, beyond this moment. Um, Cause yeah, you, you hope that it will, people will want to live with the work for a while. And um, so, you, yeah. yeah. So the, other than the painting that you've been working on for several years and you look at it and uh, are there, is there anything in particular you're working on now that you can tell us about or? Yeah, I am just right now, I'm literally trying to um, create work. Just <laughs> um, I've taken a pause really from doing exhibitions in the spring and the summer. Um, so I could focus on um, making work for um, shows in the fall and winter of next year. Um, and also just taking care of myself and resting and um, making a life and being, you know, um, I am constantly reminding myself I'm not a machine. Sure. I'm a human. And um, I have a great job that I love. And, um, but part of that work also requires that I, that I be, <laughs> that I yeah. be fully human in all the ways. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm making a life. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, I love that. And thank you for sharing your life with us uh, this evening. <laughs> it's great to be with you. You're, you're great. It's so nice to meet you. Yes. So I hop back on here. You're speaking my language. Um, one of the things I remember, Lenicia, at the beginning of COVID and quarantine, I would go for walks and I would see uh, the pavement under my feet as I walked and I would see imprints of leaves and I would see initials and I would see footprints. And I, I began to think about those as memories. Um, I begin to think about those as stories of that. The leaf is probably long gone. Um, but the, the, the essence and the holiness of it remained. Um, and that sidewalk for me became a canvas. It taught me how to see, we look all the time, but we've got to learn how to see. And I think that's part of what, uh, the arts and the beauty of art, uh, in the church, especially, mm -hmm. um, and I love that. Um, so thank you for letting me go off on that a little bit. I will say, um, I want to announce that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you do have, um, you're part of an exhibit uh, that is opening. Um, I guess the opening reception is tomorrow evening. Okay. And so um, it is at Monteroso Gallery. And that gallery is located at 1824 Spring Street. And tomorrow evening, actually, um, it opens. There's an opening reception from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, so I would encourage Palmer, Palmer's love to go to art exhibits. Palmer, Palmer's love art. And uh, one last thing I'll share before we let go is in the morning, uh, one of our small groups, one of the ways we have regathered um, as we're coming back together um, is in small groups. And one of our small groups is a photography small group. Um, and for folks who know me, I love photography, but I didn't start this. And I was thrilled to see this bubble up out of the, the congregation. And we're going to Brazos Bend state park tomorrow morning at 8 a.m as a small group from palmer and so i think that's really exciting yeah. and um so thank you and do know that you're always invited to come see what we've got in our gallery um at palmer and um maybe we'll have you exhibit there one day that would be amazing um but we are hanging a show for lent uh on monday and so we're gonna do that work on monday and so a new show will go up I could talk about this forever, but I'm not well, going to. I also do wanted to extend an invitation. I do studio visits. And oh, so, excellent. yeah, if anyone is ever interested in just coming and being in the studio and seeing the work in person, um, oh. I feel like art needs to be experienced that way. Just email me, contact me. Yeah. Thank you. What a gift um, this has been for us. And um, we are grateful for your time with us coming across the miles um, through this wonder of uh zoom and being able to do this um it, it's given us a great opportunity to do this together and i look forward to seeing you soon safe travels as you, you. return to houston thank you and neil thank you again for a great job folks thank you all for joining tonight um we this was recorded and we will be sharing this uh with the congregation and and other folks for them to experience it so everyone have a great night lanisi i'll be in touch with you soon and mm -hmm. we'll talk take care everybody bye Bye-bye.